America's smoothest smoke. No history of any classic tobacco blends would be complete without one of America's oldest, most beloved, and most successful pipe tobaccos, Velvet. In continuous production since before the turn of the 20th century, Velvet was originally created by the Spalding and Merrick Tobacco Company, a large Midwest distributor and manufacturer out of Chicago, Illinois. Spalding and Merrick specialized in fine cut, twist, and plug tobaccos, and they created Velvet to be an answer to a tobacco market saturated with oversaturated blends that were almost universally inconsistent, hard to find often, and questionably made at best. A unique and simple idea brought Velvet to life. The idea to create a pipe tobacco that would always smoke well, that was made from simple natural ingredients, was easy to find and smelled great. Choice mid-leaf Kentucky Burleys were aged in large wooden hogsheads for two years to create Velvet's signature smooth flavor and mild profile, and they advertised it. Its topping was a simple one as well. It was simple maple sugar and licorice topping. That simplicity was not only crucial to the successful marketing of Velvet, but also its production and distribution. Velvet became an almost instant success. In less than three years, Velvet had gone from being a small brand in the Midwest to one of the top selling tobaccos in America. And that success caught the attention of the Continental Tobacco Company, one of the nation's largest tobacco firms. In 1902, Continental bought Spalding and Merrick, but continued to allow them to produce Velvet under their own brand. Until two years later, that is, when Continental was merged with Consolidated Tobaccos of America and the American Tobacco Company to create an all-new and all-powerful American Tobacco Company. This new corporate entity was so powerful, in fact, that it actually bought the entire American licorice import industry to use the flavoring for their tobacco products at a lower cost. The so-called Tobacco Trust didn't last long, though. Just three years later, in 1907, they were indicted and found in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Laws of 1890. The American Tobacco Trust broke up on the same day, in fact, as Standard Oil in 1911. Four new firms were created to avoid a future monopoly and encourage competition. The American Tobacco Company kept its name, and after three of the major shareholders, you had R.J. Reynolds, Liggett and Myers, and Laurelard. Liggett and Myers were the ones who acquired the rights to two companies integral to Velvet's history, Spalding and Merrick, and the Pinkerton Tobacco Company. L&M dissolved Spalding and Merrick almost immediately and took over production of Velvet themselves. They also introduced at this time Velvet's first spokesman, Velvet Joe, a wise old man who spoke encouragingly to an America struggling its century into the First World War. He also spoke lovingly to them about simple pleasures, good friends, and the comforts of home. Old Velvet Joe actually found his way to the European front with his message when L&M was contracted by the U.S. government to supply the troops overseas. And it was there, in the trenches, that Velvet, like so many other things, was successfully repurposed by American doughboys. When they lost, broke, or just didn't have a pipe to enjoy their velvet with, it was wrapped in paper, and it ended up giving the fighting men the smoothest cigarette they could have asked for, and they remembered it when they came home. They brought that new idea with them, and Velvet acquired a whole new marketing strategy and product position that would set it further apart from its competition for decades to come. Now sold as pipe and cigarette tobacco, Velvet found itself in almost every home in America. And here again, Spalding and Merrick's original idea proved its worth. America's approach to pipe tobacco had changed, and the over-the-counter pipe and cigarette industry had taken off like a rocket, and its success was hardly hindered by the Great Depression even, as smoking was, was considered by almost everyone to be a very basic comfort 
and costs next to nothing. In fact, ads at this time for many products, including Velvet, strongly encouraged people to share their cigarettes, pipe tobacco, and other essentials whenever possible, and in a good spirit of sharing. Velvet's new role as a cigarette tobacco soon found its way right onto the tin when they replaced the old smoky lettering and pipe with a sturdy shield that displayed both avenues of Velvet's uses proudly. Throughout the 1930s and 40s, Velvet's popularity continued to climb, but World War II brought some surprises with it for the brand. Another L&M product replaced Velvet on the front lines, a new, hip cigarette that changed its color for the sake of war called Lucky Strike. The decline of Velvet had begun. Now seen by many for what it had always been, a simple pipe tobacco, it was left to the old men back home. But with the old guys, Velvet never lost any steam. It continued to be one of the best-selling tobaccos in America well into the 1960s and had always been set apart by its smooth smoking qualities and gentle flavor. Some of the younger guys even came around to Velvet's smooth, consistent pleasures as the 1950s ad campaign, Spend the Rest of Your Life with Velvet, proved. The 1960s saw a few changes for the classic blend, a shiny new can, and the removal of any mention of cigarettes in the title. Now referred to again for the first time since 1929, simply as Smoking Tobacco. This was actually part of L&M's new approach to its products, with a heavier investment in diversifying the cigarette industry. Velvet's production and promotion, as well as that of several other classic pipe tobacco blends, was transferred to one of Liggett & Meyer's subsidiary companies, Pinkerton Tobacco Company. Already one of the preeminent producers of smokeless tobacco products, most notably perhaps the red man chewing tobacco that was commonly seen on the side of barns, Pinkerton took on the responsibility admirably. But the customers noted a few changes and a new harshness that many believed was the use of humectants intended for the use of the smokeless products. Just like America had gone through a trust-busting phase, other world markets were going through similar processes near the end of the 20th century. And when the Swedish market, a huge contributor to world tobacco interest, did the same in the 1980s, L&M, which was experiencing sharp losses at the time, took the opportunity to partner and traded interests overseas, and Pinkerton ended up under new ownership, the Swedish Match Company, although they never moved production away from Pinkerton's Greensboro, Kentucky location. Some believe that the Swedish Match period was the low point in Velvet's production history, as the blend lost a great deal of its distribution and suffered in quality. There was some talk even about discontinuing Velvet, but thankfully something else happened first. There was the Scandinavian Tobacco Group, which Swedish Match possessed a strong ownership stake in, purchased Lane Limited, a powerful American asset located in Tucker, Georgia. And when the Scandinavian Tobacco Group moved Swedish Match, and therefore Pinkerton, strictly into smokeless products, Velvet's production was moved to Georgia. At the Lane facility, Velvet was brought back to its original recipe and production was ramped up. Placed in the same market as Borkham Riff, Half and Half, and Captain Black, Velvet's simple recipe has managed to keep its production costs down and it's still one of the most affordable tobaccos today, but perhaps one of the highest quality over-the-counters available. But in all its long history, Velvet has never ceased to be a proud American product and it's always been a smooth smoke. You might even call it America's smoothest smoke. This is Ben Mitchell, the Artful Codger, with his first edition.